Chief Executive and Executive Director of Spark New Zealand, let us welcome Jolie Hodson. She was appointed Chief Executive in 2019, responsible for ensuring the company has a sound strategy and applies her leadership to delivering on that strategy while building a team around her and a business that can adapt to the fast-changing world of digital services. We welcome as well the Chief Executive Officer of the excellent Ecomatters Environment Trust, Carla G. She has been Chief Executive Officer since 2022, after six months of acting as a CEO, and has been with that excellent charitable trust since 2016. She was Head of Operations before moving to the CEO role. Um, many of us love Auckland. Some of us get the chance to really represent it and make it a better place. That person, uh, probably more so in some ways, arguably, than anyone else in the room, Member of Parliament for Auckland Central, Chloe Swarbrick. She is the local MP for Auckland Central, focused on Auckland's key uh, concerns around housing, transport, environment and small business, and no stranger to radical collaboration, or often collaborating with radicals. <laughs> it can be the same thing. And finally, Johnny Freeland. Oh, we're going to welcome him back, bringing together more than 30 years of knowledge and lived experience of serving community and in guiding and navigating a range of iwi, Māori community and public sector organisations and working to achieve better outcomes with Māori. What about a round of applause for our panellists? Very good conversation earlier on. We've heard from Matthew around, I guess, the nuts and bolts, the nitty and gritty of what the Climate Action Plan means. But explain the name, because I think it's important. Oh, kia ora tato, tato. Um, Te tarukia tāwhiri is a metaphor and a mana whenua interpretation of what climate change is. Um, and... Um, Te tarukia tawhiri refers to um, the struggles and frustrations of tawhiri mātia. Uh, tawhiri mātia is one of our ancestral um, tūpuna uh, who has a responsibility for climate weather. And, and, and basically what the narrative speaks to is the frustration of Mother Earth and Sky Father in terms of poor human behaviour. And um, we've been entrapped in a 500, 600 year square system cycle, which is impacted on our whakapapa, as all humans, not just Māori. Um, te Taruki is also refers to a crayfish pot. And, and one of our Ngāti Whātua members of the Mana Whenua Forum for Tamaki Makaro referred to when he was a young boy. Um, there's a place um, up north called Taruki. And so you observe that our queer make this crayfish pot out of um, out of uh, um, the um, native materials from from a tree. So so again, te tariki refers to sort of two elements: the frustration of tafiri matia. It also challenges us that part of the solution is actually restoring, regenerating balance back to Mother Earth, and I guess that's where the plan talks about an ecological centered response response as opposed to human-centred. Um, and also te taruki is like a metaphor for a framework um, for us together, bring together all our thoughts, all our wisdom as people of Tamaki Makoto and how we sort of navigate that regeneration back to source, if you like. So, so that's in essence what te taruki a tawhiri refers to. Thank you. Let's start with perhaps an opening statement from um, our other three speakers. In response to what you've heard so far, around the conversation. Shall we start with you, Jolie? Thank you. Kia ora tato, everyone, and um, welcome here tonight. One of the things I think a lot about in terms of not only our own role as our organisation and the shifts we need to make is the impact that we have, not only for our organisation, but the businesses and the communities that we work with, and thinking around how technology might play a role in enabling that shift across different sectors, um, and how business works together to make sure that we are considering the shifts that we need to make. Because for every customer I have or supplier I have, 
there's things that we could do along that value chain that would change the way in which we're acting that influences the impact on both the environment but the people and the place. So for me, that's a big part of how I think about what we need to do. That's also not only about us working in the private sector, but it's also how we work with the public sector and the communities, and I think making sure the changes and shifts we're making, um, uh, people understand why we're doing that and, and um, how does that help move us forward. Carla, awesome. Uh, kia ora te whanau. I'm really stoked to be here tonight, and I'll be honest, quite nervous. It's a lot of people that we're looking out to here. Um, Feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome, to be honest, because I've only been uh, in the CEO role at Eco Matters for a year, but I'm just, I'm just really delighted to be here and to, and to share in this conversation with all of you, uh, and definitely with this, with this panel. And I'm really excited to be up here with these incredible people. Uh, overwhelmingly, the thing to me that is absolutely critical about Auckland Council's climate action plan is the really solid decision to move it from human-centric to ecology-centric. And for us as an organisation, that's absolutely critical to the success of the, the Climate Action Plan moving forward. Um, and it is the centre of everything that we, an, an organisation like EcoMatters, um, actually does in terms of grassroots action on the ground. So to me, that's the pivotal move. Kia ora ho ma. Um, we're just giving reckons on the climate yeah, thing. Yeah, cool. Uh, so my hot take uh, is that uh, we do a really terrible job uh, at particularly central government level, and I say this, you know, having sat on a range of different select committees and trying to unpack how there's going to be flow on effects downstream and all these other different places, but also uh, sometimes in engaging with uh, our good friends at council and trying to understand if it, you know, where it fits within the committees and all of the different flow on effects. And actually, as Matthew was saying um, at the top, you know, when we're talking about the likes of transport emission reduction plan, we actually also need to consider things like housing. We then also need to consider things like energy, as you were saying. We then also need to consider things like waste. And one of the things that you didn't raise at that point, which I know is, you know, in all of your broader work, but food systems as well are another really key component of that. So, yeah, I'm really interested in how we can shift bureaucracies, which just feel like these multi-layered onions that are the, all of the layers are risk aversion. Uh, and that risk aversion, you know, inherent in that is that no one person is ever responsible if something goes wrong. But the flip side of that is that no one responsible is no, no one person is ever responsible for things going right <laughs> or taking a risk. Uh, how do we how do we build that trust and that goodwill uh, to take those risks and to think in that kind of ecosystem way? Because that's not necessarily going to be something that we're always going to objectively agree on. Um, but yeah, just how do we move fast uh, and provide that space for that goodwill and trust for the people who are like doing really good stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Bureaucracies are, are a lot like onions in that the more you peel them away, the more you reduce to tears. Hi, yeah. um, <laughs> so uh, what we're talking about in a, in a way is peeling away those layers, those structures that stop people from having the kind of collaboration. What I want to know is when we talk about collabor collaboration, bold collaboration, radical collaboration, have, I'm going to ask each of you, have you seen any examples of really good collaboration and the outcomes? Or I'll also go with really bad collaboration that has led to a bad outcome. Matthew, shall I start with you? Yes. Thank you. So I'd like to, um, to perhaps give an example, perhaps an emerging example, and it's, um, it's right to acknowledge the, the Climate Connect Aotearoa team that are in the room here this evening. So for those of you that are unaware of, of Climate Connect Aotearoa, it's a, uh, a climate innovation hub uh, funded by Auckland Council, delivered by Tataki Auckland Unlimited, um, to consider solutions and develop those solutions with partners to enable us to transition to a low carbon resilient region. So it's, it's focused on delivering solutions that can enable us to deliver to Tāraki a Tāwhiri. Um, one, of the, one of the approaches that's being taken, and they have a fantastic team both working on Climate Connect Aotearoa and advising on Climate Connect Aotearoa, is working with partners across different sectors on a number of challenges, with those challenges focused on uh, the built environment, food, transport, and um, one other, please? Energy, of course. Um, so... Um, a shout out to the Climate Connect Aotearoa team. I think it's a great example of how we are looking at um, collaboration in a new way in Tamaki Makaurau. Brilliant. Shall I go down the line or shall I go straight to you, Johnny? 
I'm, I'm happy to add. Um, I guess an observation point um, from our people is, um, yeah, we, 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 we talk about uh, reimagining, reframing, resetting the system, but we're not really doing that. You know, we're just rolling out the same square approach. And what I mean square is the Western centric, mm -hmm. you know, and, and one thing that is exciting is we're starting to see a shift to circular regenerative thinking. Um, we, we live in that circular view as Māori. Um, we've had uh, 150 years of impacts from the square system, urbanisation, westernisation and colonisation that has displaced, disconnected many of our people from the whenua, from Papa Tunuku. And, and that's part of the source why our kids are doing memory. And until we see that heart of this is all about oranga and well-being, we're going to continue to functionalise into these ologies and not look at the tangas that tie everything together. And I think um, the hope within Te Taruki Atafiri is it talks about a holistic response and we're starting to see a shift from a square to a circular, which is really exciting. Um, because once you get two circles, then you get into some opportunities for real radical collaboration. Um, our circular thinking, our spiral thinking is intergenerational. We need at least three generations working together now. Mm. So it's really awesome seeing heaps of young people, but heaps of elders in the room too. Mm. So how do we tap into that wisdom of our elders? And then um, all our young people that are full of that Maui energy yeah. push the boundaries. But we need to do at least three, at a minimum, three generations together. And, and, the, and the work we're doing out of, in, in a practical way in Pūnui is an intergenerational approach. Amazing. People like the um, Keep Manukau Beautiful, the Friends of the Pūnui, you know, a lot of retired beautiful people that are giving back to the community, giving mm. back to the awa, but we've got to connect them to the young people so that we're getting a bit of transgenerational wisdom sharing. Um, I think local government, central government has a role but they're there to be at the back to support, not there to be at the front leading, because they just functionalise, create bureaucracies. Um, the Climate Connects the Gate opportunity, which we talked about, this innovation hub, when we were doing the plan, but it was envisioned to be centred in the community, not another part of the Kaunihira. And, and, you know, so we've got to think about the role to enable to support because the action's all sitting in here, in the room. And, and it has to be community, whānau anchored, connected to a place, um, and then do some system stuff. So it's got to be more than just emission reduction and adaption. It's about oranga. Our people are resilient. We've been resilient for a thousand years in this location, despite other impacts. If we weren't resilient, we wouldn't be here. You know, so we're having to relearn, regenerate our way of being, our, our knowledge systems, but that thousand year knowledge or practice, so looking back into what we call our whakapapa centred way of being and, and looking at all those interconnections. So, so it's, a, it's a good start, I have to say that, because I was part of the forum in framing it. <laughs> but what's interesting is what gets pulled out, because there's some real deep magical stuff the, the mana whenua well-being framework to Ora or Tamaki Makoto, um, the, the shifts that we talk about, transport shifts is one. But if we're not regenerating nature, if we're not regenerating our whakapapa, you know, at, at one hand we're getting rid of mature trees across Auckland. Those are like our komatu and elders. We need them. We can plant a billion trees, but they're all babies. So we need to think about the balance and, and how we bring that and, and we need to do it together because race can't be an issue as part of our climate response or our well-being response. Yeah. You know? so, so, you know, um, the other radical collaboration is we've got 19 mana whenua of Iwi of Auckland and we're having to learn to partner and collaborate because we've had um, 150 years of division and square systems that have impacted, yet if we all stood on Maunga Fau together, we're all the same people. 
So we're having to look to partner. So when you think about partnering with mana whenua, think about how mana whenua have to partner in order to partner with you, not just thinking about your part of the partnership. And there's some beautiful examples of that type of collaboration. Uh, we're not scary, you know. Um, we've been hard done by a bit, but we're still a young country and really hopeful around our future and what sits within our our mokopuna and all our young people that are driving that way forward. Uh, it, it just excites me. I live in a four-generational home. My mum just turned 82 um, last week. And, and um, we had a new baby, a mokopuna, arrive in our whare on the 3rd of October. So that baby's going to have a, a seven-generational view by the time she becomes a nanny. You know, that, that's, you know, as whānau as people of Tamaki Makoto. Those are ways that we need to think about how we respond to ourselves in the way we, we restore that balance. So, kia ora. Thank you, Johnny. Carla. Thank you, Rada. Okay, so um, the, the uh, radical collaboration that I wanted to talk very quickly about is actually um, not solely located within Tamaki Makoto. It's actually a collaboration that happens all over our motu. Uh, and it is a collaboration between three uh, community networks, um, the Community Energy Network, the Zero Waste Network, and Environment Hubs Aotearoa. We are all community organisations doing grassroots actions within our communities all over New Zealand, um, really making a difference uh, uh, in terms of climate actions for our own communities. It has its unique flavour wherever we are operating around the country. But I think what is really amazing about uh, this collaboration is that the work we do is completely open sourced. And what I mean by that is that we might be an organisation that spends five years um, developing a program that we know works really, really well for our community. And another uh, sister organisation might come to us from Invercargill and say, look, you know, we really think that you guys are onto something in this home energy space. We want to run a program exactly or similar to what you guys have done, add on the nuances of our community, and we give them everything everything that we've learned over five years, our budgets, our processes, our quality assurance, um, uh, we, we fly down, we, we help them, and most importantly, we talk about the pinch points that come along the way for community organisations. How do you set up? How do you get partner, uh, partner funding? Um, who should you collaborate with? Who are you already working with in that space? Who else could you actually look to bring in? But that open source um, is a really just incredible opportunity Opportunity, uh, for those three networks. Uh, I've just come back from an incredible hui uh, last uh, week done at Lake Karapiro with all three of those organisations actually coming together. And I would like to do a shout out to the Ministry for the Environment for actually helping to fund that opportunity for us to come together um, and share our knowledge and our expertise. So it is really a, a radical collaboration that I believe uh, is a really good example of it working very well. Brilliant. Don't stop. If you want to applaud, don't <laughs> stop. <laughs> hey, Jolly, like, not only are you at Spark, you're also um, the convener of the Climate Leaders Coalition. Can you, in, very quickly, maybe for people who don't know, they probably do explain what that is, but then yeah. what kind of collaboration are you seeing within that kind right. of structure? Yes, yeah, so Climate Leaders Coalition is really around um, businesses coming together, committing to a science-based target, uh, committing to reporting that externally, committing to scope one and two emissions reductions, but most importantly committing to working together because the reality is we can't solve um, all of the things that we need to do on our own and I might be a customer of one supply chain, someone else is a customer of ours, so it's actually taking the time uh, to spend on sharing ideas, thinking about the different areas, whether that's in energy, transport, um, agriculture, and obviously got a particular interest in technology and the role that that might play in enabling the shifts we want to see. So how do we make sure that we make the most of the infrastructure that we're building? Um, and not only the infrastructure, but how we connect and understand the data that that produces, and, it's, and it changes our behaviour. So if you think about, for example, Westpac Muscle Farm is a good example of that. They had a problem where they were wanting to understand the salinity um, of the seawater at a particular time because that impacts harvest. 
So one of the things that we were able to solve that with was a data boy that went into the water. So that meant, um, and then across our IoT network, technology network, we could then send every 15 minutes signal about what was happening in the salinity. Not only did it change the amount of time that went around harvesting, the amount of time that went around, um, I guess, boats having to go out, it shifted the, the level of production. And so those are some of the things, the small things that technology can do, not only in enabling that, but actually the data and insight that goes with it to actually change behavior. And that's really what we all need to be doing. And I think from that, that meant that we worked together with a company called Adroit. So that was a manufacturing company. We then worked together with the Muscle Farm to try and solve this. So none of us could have done it individually. But as a group, we could solve it. And that's just one example of how it works. Mostly that means, and, and I was thinking about that radical collaboration and what's a good example where you had to actually do something at pace. You had no choice. You had to work with others. And really when you think, you used the word BC before, so before COVID. Well, all of you can remember when COVID hit and we shut down the country pretty much immediately. That meant that everyone had to move home to be able to work, to learn, to connect. So that meant there was a huge amount of collaboration required, both with customers, with community partners. So how did we make sure the people that needed devices most, that needed to connect most, could get access to it? And I think, when I think about how that worked over a very short period of time, what that made me wonder about is, what lessons are there from that? When there was a burning platform, when we had to move, what are the things that you put aside or leave out um, and don't get caught up in? versus other times where everyone can come with their own perspective about how something should be done, which isn't really collaboration. It's really around bringing your ideas and looking to consult on them, not really thinking about what's the actual problem we're trying to solve. That was a long answer to that, I know. But, right. <laughs> but it is, that's what I think we need to see more of across different parts. Of the, and it's not just about business, it's about individuals and communities working together to solve those issues. And then those stories need to be celebrated and... and uh, what's the word? And, and, and emphasise so that people know that all of this stuff is going yeah. on. Look, I, I tell you, people who know what's going on generally, um, because everybody wants to tell them, Chloe, is the government. <laughs> uh, and I, I imagine you see no. Sh uh, I mean, you are the responsibility. You, you, you were elected to be the official. <laughs> on behalf of the government. Uh, on, yeah, well, <laughs> we can live in hope. Um, <laughs> what do you see that. The, that, that in terms of that collaboration that you've been able to really supercharge or drive through from a, a political party, a governmental mm. kind of point of view, or, or ultimately what you think could be done better? So many things. Uh, so I'll start actually at a really local level because uh, despite all of the big system level stuff that obviously we're all aiming for, um, I think it is really important that we actually also start with the tangible grassroots stuff because that's where you get proof of concept and people can start to get, God forbid, some hope that things are possible and then we can build on that. And I think that that kind of feedback loop of disengagement that we presently have, particularly when we're talking about politics and parliament with a big P, uh, we're talking about you know people not seeing the action that they want from the systems that we have and then choosing to disengage from that uh, or being disempowered by it. And then as a result of that lack of engagement, there's even less representation about the things that they believe in or the people who they want to be represented by. And then, hey presto, we get less action and so on and so forth. It's a really awful downward spiral. Um, a really local example of that was actually also just kind of on the COVID uh, theme. Uh, at the start of this year was when Omicron came? Yep, cool, start of this year, last two years of soup. Um, at the start of this year, uh, when Omicron uh, outbreak was just starting, I was calling around all of the different NGOs in Auckland Central and going, where are the system vulnerabilities? What is gonna fall over, particularly for our most structurally marginalized communities? if we have your workforce or your volunteer base hit by this Omicron wave? What, you know, what's the setup? Where can we fix these vulnerabilities? And uh, as a result, in talking to a range of these different services, um, was having a conversation with Danielle uh, Legale, who runs uh, Sunday Blessings uh, out of Alan Melville Hall. I've had a bit to do with over the past two years. And uh, we found that basically the volunteers weren't gonna be there uh, if everybody got sick, to ensure that street whānau were fed on Sunday nights. And that hot meal is a really important part of our street community's kind of routine through the week. And it's also that community engagement. You know, the amount of emails that I get with people complaining about street whānau and about homelessness, 
I would just implore people to exercise their empathy gland and perhaps engage with some of those people that we're so accustomed to stepping over and understanding their life stories. Because if that one email or those five people who complained about those things turned into advocates for those people, we would freaking end homelessness. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, but in that process of uh, kind of pulling together an understanding of what was happening on the ground, we worked with Student Volunteer Army, who I've had a bit to do with over the past few years, who are awesome, and they'd just set up this awesome app thing where people could, you know, say that they wanted to volunteer for stuff. Uh, we used them, uh, and then uh, kind of through our different networks, uh, kind of set up this program of people who would be available to organize and at the front lines and keep these meals consistent. If different people got sick, we had COVID protocols and all those different things. And while it's really awesome and it's been ongoing and actually another core part of that co-papa is diverting food that would otherwise go to landfill because we want to talk about holistic ecosystems and about forced scarcity by the fact that we intentionally waste a heck of a lot of food again uh, and just the economic system that we currently have being broken. Uh, if we are focused on those experiences that particularly those young people who have been engaged in that Omicron resilience team uh, have learnt, it has really expanded our notion of what it is to have a community and who belongs to that community and in turn I think has upskilled people to be advocates for that systemic level change. Um, so yeah, that's the stuff that I get really excited about. Great. So it's always never struck me as a the most thing that, that, that um, many countries have, you know, um, community service is a wonderful thing, and yet here we use the phrase community service uh, for people who will be punished. <laughs> they go and, you know, yeah. are you talking, uh, Johnny and Chloe and Carla, around that importance of, of those local actions <laughs> and local people looking after that little part of their world? Yeah, and if I can actually just add to an even awesomer part of that story is that through, you know, just having to move fast and make it happen because nobody else was going to do it, um, we proved that kind of proof of concept not only for all of us who were engaged in that project, but also for council who gave uh, Sunday Blessings some money. Um, so shout out to TAF yeah. in particular and to Duncan and to Auckland Council. That's why I pay my rates and I'm very <laughs> happy to do so. Matthew, it brings us back to you. I touched you as if you were some kind of subordinate. Uh, <laughs> sorry. We're talking about it. You're sitting there in, in, in council as the Chief Sustainability Officer. What, what are the conversations you have around consult, that, that sense of radical consult, cons consultation with Manu Whenua business, community, youth, local, central government? What, how, is that, how is that shaping? How do, you, how do you use that to drive what you need to do? Or to hear what it is that people want you to do? Yeah, so in response to that question, it's also worth reflecting on some of the, um, the responses that we've just heard. And one of the themes that's coming through from the discussion is, is the sense of common purpose. Um, whether that be common purpose for sharing information, sharing data, sharing processes um, with organizations or individuals that are in a, a similar position, whether it be um, sharing information through the systems we have in place and enabling a better outcome, or whether it be people uniting towards a common purpose to drive change. Um, and certainly COVID brought that into to sharp focus for us all. It really demonstrated um, what can be achieved when we all, or certainly the vast majority of us, work towards a common purpose. Um, it, en it enables us to act quickly, and it enables us to uh, act with certainty. And so in response to your question, I'd, I'd just like to weave that into the thinking in terms of some of the, the conversations we're certainly having around um, a common purpose and the, the, the rising um, visibility and significance of a common purpose around climate action. And that common purpose is being driven by a number of factors. It's being driven by the, the climate impacts that we are, we are observing, that we're seeing both in, in New Zealand, we only have to look to the rainfall events over this past winter, but also internationally in the focus on uh, whether it be Australia, the floods in Pakistan, or the heat waves in, in, in Europe. Um, so that common awareness of the, the increasing scale and, and, and impact of, of climate change being something that's bringing that common purpose together, but also importantly, um, a, a growing, a growing realization and a growing um, buy-in to the fact that climate action is a vehicle for positive change. Climate action is a vehicle for creating 
a more just, a more equitable society, if done in the correct way, of course. Um, it's not just about reducing emissions. It's not just about reducing risk to climate change, as, as Johnny just said. It's about it's about honoring, it's about well-being, and ensuring that we that we develop a system and we transition to a system that enables us all to live better lives, that is um, more equitable, more just, and and using climate action not just as a um, a, a, a mode to reduce emissions and reduce climate risk, but a, as, a, as a vehicle to creating a better future. So one of the things that we certainly discuss is a common purpose. And when we're looking at collaboration, uh, one of the specific initiatives that we are, that we are working on, um, and a big shout out to Dave Watson, who's in the room this evening for, for leading this, our regional partnerships group. Um, and also, Dave, thank you for all your work bringing together this panel and for your work um, making tonight happen along with others. So our regional, um, our regional leadership group will focus on establishing cross-sectoral partnerships to deliver climate action um, with um, leaders across sectors that are focused on a common purpose, focused on a common purpose of delivering positive change through climate action. Because I'm wondering, because there was a question, and I think it's a good one here that's just come from Janet. Um, uh, look, we know systemic, and it relates to this in a, in a way, we know systemic change is more successful if people are part of a connected community. How do we ensure that community is connected to that conversation? Mm. Because, again, we hear that we're going to talk with leaders and these associations. How do we bring it back from, from mm. these very high-level mm. situations mm. through to us standing at the Opanuku stream, going, what's happening out here? Sorry? From bullshit to action. Look, I didn't say that, madam. You did. Um, <laughs> let's rephrase. Uh, from, uh, from, from, the, from the grassroots, the fertilised roots of the grass to, to actual action. How do we get at that sense that communities understand what's happening, their voices are heard, and through that understanding and a sense that their voices are heard, they get on board mm. and they become a part of this journey? Who wants to, who wants to take that one on? Chloe. Um, I mean, one of the things that I find really interesting is that this actually goes back to kind of one of the core things that Johnny was laying out, which is that I don't think that it is actually, we have so much prescription by central and local government about what communities have to get up to, and there's not enough identifying the people who are already trying to do this stuff and then creating the environment conducive to them being able to just do it. <laughs> like, there's so many examples of that from composting uh, through people uh, pedestrianising streets all by themselves, uh, and a range of other uh, examples where, yeah, we have community leaders already out there and doing it. And I worry that, uh, and I see this particularly from kind of, again, in the select committees, I, I worry that so much of the procurement processes for both central and local government are so prescriptive in the criteria that are necessary for the programs to be rolled out that there isn't enough of that leniency and that trust and that goodwill and that appropriate decision making at a grassroots level, which then means that you ironically kill the thing before it is born because you have said that it needs to be square when maybe it needs to be circle. I don't know if I'm just mixing all my metaphors, but. Is there a way to, because you're in the digital sector, is there a, uh, you know, and we're digitally connected, many of us, um, for our sins, is, is there Look, a way? Look, I mean, there, there's lots of tools that can be enabled to uh, hear feedback, hear points of view. It still comes back to how much are we listening versus how much are we sort of speaking, and then how much does that lead to action from there? So there's lots of tools that, I mean, we've got lots of them here today. We've got Slido, we've got other things. There's all sorts of ways you can get contribution. But the question really becomes, how hard do we listen to the people most affected in those particular areas that also may already, um, like your great examples about the open sourcing of sharing of different solutions, how could you actually accelerate that so that you got more movement uh, forward than um, actually having to reinvent everything? Because the reality is a lot of the answers are already there. It's about actually bringing it together in a way uh, that's meaningful. And let's face it, um, in that COVID example I gave before, we knew that the people in the community that already had those relationships were the best way of actually um, getting either modems or other things to the people that most needed it. It wasn't us. We could enable it, but we weren't the ones that were going to do that. So working with the partners. So I think that's part of it. It's really having a view that 
you don't have to own and control every part of it. You have to bring together the people that can um, make a difference and be open to hearing different ways of approaching it. This is a lot quicker and a lot more fluid. And we've actually seen that in some of the major cities around the world. They've just gone out and just cracked on with stuff. Admittedly, when we went out and cracked on with stuff in central Henderson, people were outraged, uh, particularly at the fact the intersection was painted blue. And a lot of time and effort and mental energy was spent complaining about a blue intersection. <laughs> Excellent. Um, hey, look, so my question is, um, it came up really, and it was an infrastructure question, and I'm not sure whether it fits into the scope, but I'm going to ask it because 15 people um, wanted to know. Is it a priority of council to ensure adequate infrastructure upgrades to cope with the housing intensification placing less pressure on our environment? I mean, I, I guess, Matthew? I mean... Is it a priority of council to ensure adequate infrastructure upgrades to cope with housing intensification, placing less pressure on our environment? I mean, I guess. Well, yes, um, that is Thanks. that is part Thanks. of the role of council, and and certainly just to pick up on the last part of it, um, in terms of ensuring that infrastructure doesn't degrade the environment. Was that the question? I think well, one for the benefit, I think, for the benefit less of pressure <coughs> on the environment. Yeah, and I think one of the things we need to think about when we when we develop plan design infrastructure is um, thinking about how infrastructure solutions, planning infrastructure, can have a positive impact on the environment. And that's something that we need to consider in every decision we make so that we're not just looking at infrastructure as something that necessarily has a negative influence on the environment, but infrastructure is an opportunity. Infrastructure is an opportunity to deliver positive change through um, the planning and design of that infrastructure. Um, I think it goes back to that human-centric design and consult. I've seen some incredible pieces of infrastructure that has absolutely transformed communities, isn't it? And again, that's where that consultation and radical collaboration comes in. I also think it's that thing of, so if this part of infrastructure is being changed now, what else needs, what else would you do at the same time rather than having everything sequentially go after each other? and that ability to work together to get the solution, and that means that broader listening, working across different parts. Of course, the danger with that is, is that then the journalists in the Herald conflate that um, per kilometre of cycleway <laughs> to say, look at this gold-plated cycleway, as opposed to look at all of the infrastructure that was changed to make this entire environment a much better place mm. for everybody to live for the next 30 years. Mm. Matthew. And, and just to touch on that point, I think when we look at the cost per kilometre of cycleway, let's also bear in mind that we don't include the cost of stormwater upgrades. We don't include the cost of planting trees. We don't include the costs of the utilities under the surface that have been upgraded and are using the cycling budget and therefore elevating and uh, increasing the cost per kilometre of cycling infrastructure. Let's just focus on the cost per kilometre of the actual cycling infrastructure. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Oh, the gentleman um, out there uh, who asked a question that we're all thinking, <laughs> but won't ask. All right. Uh, go. I'd just like to pick up on um, perhaps a sentiment I'm feeling from, from some of the audience, in that when I spoke about the need to develop a, a regional partnerships group and approach to um, um, responding to a common purpose, that is not necessarily without the um, input and the partnership collaboration with the community, which is perhaps what is being suggested through some of the heckles. Um, one of the things that's very important here is that when we are developing any approach, it needs to be in collaboration and in partnership with the community. Um, one of the things that we also need to look at is how we engage with the community. Um, we have consultations, we have public surveys, but do they accurately represent the community that we're serving as Auckland Council? And well. A rhetorical question, and um, and I would agree with you. So how do we how do we um, ensure that those um, those members of our community that aren't typically represented aren't typically heard in the consultations, the engagement techniques that we use are heard, are represented, and are informing the direction of travel? Because it's very important. Because there's a lot of privilege in those. You know, we've all we can all all of us have the time and the ability to come here this evening and to 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 listen and to be heard. But there is a huge swathe of Auckland for whom that's not possible. Carla. No, I do want to just jump in there and say that um, one of the key things that I think we absolutely need to take on board is the need not to expect community to come to us, 
but for us to go to them. It is their places where they gather, at sports grounds, at places of faith where they worship, um, at places of entertainment that they may be, and areas that they are already actually um, gathering that we want to go and we actually want to be engaged and we want to hear that voice. And community organisations are amazing at being able to get that feedback. Um, I think expecting uh, community to actually provide feedback through the current methods that are actually used um, just don't work. We don't hear from the people that we really, really want to be hearing from. They're not going to engage through that process. So we have to be um, thinking much more broadly about how we capture those thoughts uh, and what our communities feel about that. And, and when people do go to be engaged, I remember standing at the Pukekohe Vegetable Festival and they had, uh, I think it was Panuku, had a, a little stand there and they were talking about the, re, uh, the realignment of that kind of main street. And a guy stood and talked at me for about 10 minutes around what he thought would be a better idea. And I said, sir, I can't do anything about this, but right there with that big sign is someone who has come here to specifically hear you talk about that. So when that opportunity presents itself, you know, to engage in that conversation and that dialogue, take it. No point telling me, you know, I can't do anything. Here's my question um, then, uh, how, how do we, and, and someone has asked it, I'm just gonna find out where it is because it relates exactly to this. Um, what's, what needs to change, um, where is it? It's um, looking at the, uh, it's to do with all of this. How, how do we actively encourage then that conversation around this and engage people and communities from that very base level and allow their voices to be filtered up? Johnny, any ideas? that one on board. Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it. No, but I mean, seriously, it, it, yeah, it is, it is a cognitive dissonance. What's the definition of cognitive dissonance? It's holding two uh, completely contrary facts or things that you're hoping for, ideals, whatever, in your mind at the same time, contemporaneously, and it makes you uncomfortable. We just kind of have to face up to that and look it in the face, because you know what? Climate change is uncomfortable. The world is changing regardless of whether we choose to adapt or not, regardless of whether we choose to reduce our emissions and you know, make our demise all the faster or not. So um, I think actually though, I just wanted to briefly kind of address the point as raised about kind of systems change and engagement, um, but also the question from the floor earlier about how do we work with our new mayor? Uh, and uh, also the person who heckled as Johnny was speaking Sir, if we were to design a system, whoever that sir was who yelled out, uh, that was capable, let alone competent with dealing with the challenges of our time, you would not design the colonial Westminster parliamentary system. That system is, oh, I know, it sucks. It is self-perpetuating. There is a reason that we're interrogating the system that is producing all of these problems over and over and over again, because it needs to change. So how do we go about changing that? I don't do you, think do you it's know, a, do, I don't do you, think it's what, a binary. What, no, 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 no. What, what do you think? No, can you please shush? Can you, can, what do you think communism is? Please define it. Stand up. Define communism. No, define communism, please. Well, you're actually defining communism, which is the same rights applying to everybody, but... Okay, you've had your piece, can you please sit down? Thank you. You've defined communism from your perspective. So what you've defined communism as is a dictatorship. No. Communism is an economic system which is about doling out effectively equal amounts to everybody. Sir, so you've Thanks. had your piece, okay? I gave it to you. Thanks. I gave it to you. That's authoritarianism. I'm about to outline I'm, it for you. To be fair, I'm, I'm not sure we could have a conversation about this until the cows come home. Uh, but they're everybody's cows. Everyone gets one. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, so the, the point America's the, a democracy, and yeah. boy, look how they're doing. 
So, so the point that I'm trying to make to you is that what you were talking about is a very value-loaded term from your perspective. Communism really means... I have let you say your piece. Please sit down and listen to me. Okay, well, I'm responding to exactly your point, which is that... Com you can have your own panel. This is, I'm answering your question. Oh, well, you can stand Kapai, for the answer. Stand up. Okay. So, authoritarianism, which is what you were saying about the state dictating absolutely everything, is a form of a lack of democracy, right? When you're talking about communism, you're talking about an economic system in terms of who's getting access to what. So I think that you're conflating the two there, and that's leading us to the conclusion that you have, with this term communism, that you've loaded a lot of values and a lot of anger onto, and means that we're not having a very productive conversation. No. So, so to gonna... really boil it down to first principles about what we're trying to achieve here, we are all on this panel. I am democratically elected to work with people who disagree with me to try and achieve outcomes. I'm in the Greens, mate. I can't do anything by myself. I have to collaborate consistently across the aisle. That is the opposite of authoritarianism and communism, which you seem very concerned with. Good. No, so, we're gonna, sorry, we're going to get back to the initial thing, wa which was collaborating with the new mayor, which I think was <laughs> the kind of... So collaborating, Where we started off yeah. before we got sidetracked so by communism. So I've had a very constructive meeting you did. with our new mayor. Uh, and this meeting started from exactly that point of what are our first principles? What are the things that we agree on? Because I'm sure we can all say, especially based on all of the assumptions and the symbols of who we are, that there are things that we disagree on. But the things that we agree on is that we want local democracy, that is, more power to our local boards... <laughs> We want to see more parks, we want to see protection of the Hauraki Gulf, and he seems to care a lot about business cases. So while we were talking about business cases, I made the case that some of the best return for investment that you can get is by virtue, particularly in the city centre, with the likes of pedestrianisation, but also the likes of our cycleways and reallocation of road space and all of those other things. So that kind of really proactive collaboration and consensus building looks like starting from first principles and trying to understand the language that each of us are using, which is why, sir, I asked you to define the language that you were yelling at me, because it helps a lot if we can understand the words that each of us are using and what we assume they mean. Thank you. Look, I'm... I'm now going to flip this conversation because for a long time there is a sense that individuals can actually make a difference when actually a part of this is systemic and structural and I'm thinking about large businesses in particular. What is the role within all of this of, of, of the large businesses? You're on the Climate um, Leaders Coalition. What are the discussions that you are having around that, that role of the systemic change that can be driven by businesses and investment not communism, uh, to make these changes and empower communities to do the things they need to do. So I think the conversations we're having as a business, first of all, looks at our own shop and says, what do we need to do to make sure that we're making change? 80% of our emissions are electricity, so making sure we're working with our energy partners and making sure we're investing in new technologies in our business and removing out ones that um, have significant uses. Then you think across... The, um, across the coalition, what we're looking at is how do we invest? And across, if you look at the last um, uh, snapshot that was just done of those 100 businesses that belong to the Climate Leaders Coalition, there's around 9.5 billion of investment will go in in the next five years to make the transitions that we need to see. And that's across energy, it's across um, agriculture, and it's also across industry. And that's about us each taking action in our own business. We obviously can't do that in isolation. We need to work with the communities we operate in. We need to think about what enables other components because there's some things that run horizontally across different verticals. Um, if you think about how you, how you can use technology to connect, for example, versus potentially flying somewhere, they are all options that you can start to think about. How does them, do they each play a part and how do we work collectively to make sure that we are moving forward as a group and that we take responsibility in the communities that we operate in. So that's what um, Climate Leaders Coalition is all about. It's actually about each of us holding ourselves to account and each other. It's about transparency and measuring what we're doing. 
But it's also about creating innovation. Until you work together and you share ideas across, you don't actually know. Spending judgment, trying to understand the different components of it that allows you to think about how would we innovate and change. We do. T Can you, you want to respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think one of the things that is really important from a community organisation's perspective is um, how do we collaborate with businesses and what does that look like? Um, we are we are very good patting ourselves on the back here, but we are very good at the collaboration piece with our communities and we work, you know, incredibly closely with our communities and that, you know, that includes our schools um, and just, you know, everybody within the community. But what does it look like actually working with businesses that are actually also in our community? And when I think about that, when I think about businesses, of course you start to think about the size of the business that you're actually talking about. So if it's a multinational business or, uh, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the likes of Deloitte's or Mondelez or, you know, those kind of organisations, then it's probably uh, realistic to expect that their uh, sustainability plan uh, will actually be written at head office somewhere else around the world and then delivered out to, to all of their organisations. So it's unlikely. Um, that that plan will necessarily talk about any community collaboration. Uh, for national organisations, if we look at the likes of the warehouse group or main freight, those kind of businesses, then um, often what we find is they also do absolutely want to work in collaboration with their communities, but probably with organisations that have a national, um, a national reach. So organisations, you know, amazing organisations like Forest and Bird or uh, Sustainable Coastlines, those kind of organisations that, that have that national spread. But as community organisations, the businesses that we know we can work really closely with are our local businesses. And we know how many of the, there are of those in Tamaki Makoto. They are the small businesses that are actually really, uh, that, you know, they understand the needs of their community. You know, they've lived there, they've run their businesses there, they know their neighbours, they know the community organisations in their space. Um, and those definitely are the businesses that, for us at community level, um, are the ones that um, get us, uh, get the work that we're trying to do at the grassroots level and really want to engage with us and collaborate with us. So um, that's what I would say. One other thing that I would like to really quickly talk about from a business perspective is that so often when you go into businesses, or certainly when I speak to businesses, um, they often will talk to you about all the sustainability um, that they are doing within their, you know, within their big within the business, and, and it might be huge, the amount of work that they're doing there. But what I think is a massive untapped resource in that space, and I'd love to see more big businesses look at doing, is actually um, looking at ways that they can help their teams, their staff, to actually go, start their journey in terms of climate actions. And that may be around some really simple things, holding workshops at work that talk about how people can reduce their energy consumption in their homes and reduce their water consumptions in their homes? Um, can we set sort of fun challenge days where all of the staff can look at different ways of actually getting to work, different types of transportation, whether that be public transportation, cycling, walking, whatever it may be. But there are opportunities within many businesses to really look at what your staff are doing and what education opportunities you're providing for them within the climate action space. So what you're essentially saying is it's all very well and good for the council and the government to do whatever they want, but it falls down to individuals making conscious decisions about their own behaviour, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. Matthew, there was a question that came through, and um, is Te uh, Tauriki Atafari, is it a statutory document? Where does it sit? We've been talking around all of this and the Climate Action Plan. Where does it sit? How much power does it have or not have? It is not a statutory document. So Te Tāraki Atafari is not a statutory plan. Um, f the unitary plan, for example, is a statutory plan. So Te Tāraki Atafari, and this was um, brought to the, the public's attention, the media's attention through uh, recent legal proceedings relating to the, the status of Te Tāraki Atafari. So it is not a statutory plan. However, it was unanimously approved by the governing body at Auckland Council. So it has unanimous approval around the council table. It is a strategic plan that informs the development of 
direction at Auckland Council across departments and teams. So no, it's not statutory, but that does not undermine its importance. The, the status of the plan being non-statutory does not mean that it doesn't have value. Of course it does. It's a, a climate action plan for delivering a positive change in Tamaki Makaurau for delivering climate action developed in partnership with Mana Whenua. The plan is respected, the plan is um, upheld through the decisions we have at council. So just because it's not statutory does not mean that it shouldn't be upheld. Great. Final, because we're nearly out of time and we could talk forever. Uh, Final question, and I'm going to ask it to, to, to everyone. Um, I'm going to start with Matthew and finish with, with Johnny, go down the line. Mm. Biggest threat, biggest opportunity that Auckland has, uh, I, I guess. Let, let's start with that. Uh, around, and particularly, let's bring it around the sense of radical collaboration and the need to find a pathway through disparate voices. Because, mm. you know, we live in an age of polarisation, um, possibly, uh, well, arguably, certainly in my lifetime, I don't know that we've been as polarised. So what do we do with this radical, what is the, the biggest threat to Auckland and the biggest opportunity that we think of when it comes to this kind of radical collaboration and the future of Auckland for the next 20 years? Matthew, big question. So biggest threat to Auckland in terms of radical collaboration, I would say the biggest threat is that we, um, we spend a lot of time talking about collaboration and what it is and what it isn't and whether communities are included in our decisions or not, when of course they should be, um, and we don't actually deliver the models for collaboration and the momentum that we need to deliver change. The biggest opportunity... Oh, yes. Oh, look, I haven't uh, taken a question. Oh, oh, oh that was... A, uh, I'm going to take you because your, your arm was thrust into the air with such vigour, I thought you were going to dislocate your shoulder. Madam, there's a mic so that we can hear. I had a feeling this would come up, and you know what I'm going to do? Thank you. I'm going to ignore that question because of lack of time. Uh, and will to live. I don't really think that we have the ability to, to answer on their behalf, madam, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't really care. How rude. So... Just let's just touch on C40 for a moment. C40 is a global network of cities taking bold action on climate change. There is no membership fee for, C for Auckland Council to be a member of C40. It is a leadership standard led organization. So we are required to meet bold, ambitious leadership standards to maintain our membership of C40. The benefit we get from C40 is that we are part of a global network of nearly 100 cities sharing knowledge and best practice on climate action and enabling all other cities to up their game through that sharing of information and best practice. There's no global agenda here. C40 is a membership organization pursuing and progressing best practice on climate action. It's a radical collaboration. Thank you, Matthew. We're gonna to go to... Can I, can I give my opportunity? Go on. So opportunity, I believe one opportunity we have as Auckland is our scale. We are a region that um, has the, the scale that I believe is well suited to collaboration across communities, across sectors, to deliver positive change relating to climate action. I think that's a great opportunity that we have. We're not too small, we're not too big. We are an appropriate size for meaningful change. No. Oh. Very, like, if, if I don't like it, I'm going to cut it short only because we're running out of time. Oh, what is the greatest? No, I didn't really ask the question. What is the greatest climate threat to Auckland? What is the greatest climate threat to Auckland? Lack of action? The, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, Matthew, very good. Greatest climate threat to Auckland in two words or less. It's, I'm not. I, I haven't answered the question yet. I'm trying to understand exactly the meaning behind your question. Um, of course I can. I could give you a long list of climate impacts, but I don't believe that's the basis for your question. I believe it is more loaded than that. So I'm yeah. going to refrain from answering. Jolie. I think in terms of the, the biggest threat is that we don't move forward and don't start taking action. 
I wasn't Hang asked on, to. We're, we're just wrapping <laughs> up, and if you want to have a continued conversation, then you're more than welcome, yeah. but there's a whole lot of people here who probably have a bus to wait for. Because I think each of us individually have got a role to play in of our organisations and the communities that we work in. So we have got plans. We need to start moving forward. And I think the second part, which has been heard well here today, is how do we better listen and um, take that consultation into those plans? Brilliant. Thank Carla. you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep, I'm, I'm on a similar vein. Uh, I think the biggest threat is finding an excuse to do nothing. Uh, or stay the same, doing exactly what we're doing. I think the opportunity is that uh, Tamaki Makoto is an amazingly beautiful city. It is full of incredibly smart, dynamic, energetic, incredible people. And I, I think that is absolutely, without a doubt, our opportunity. We just need to listen to each other to make the steps forward that we need to take. Chloe. I can't help myself, but with the Bloomberg's mention, we should absolutely tax the rich to pay for all of these great things. Um, uh, what is the biggest threat? Honestly, the biggest threat is individuation. Um, the biggest threat, I mean, you were making the point um, before, Tereda, about how um, you know individuals making conscious decisions. That's awesome, but unless we fix the defaults, that is the kind of blinders that we have on conscious or not about the decisions and the options that are available to us, especially when we're time-pressed and under so much exhaustion because of all of the things that we have to do in modern life, then we're not going to make that necessary system change. So I do really worry about how, you know, particularly in Tamaki Makoto um, Central, in my electorate, I have the highest rates of renters in the country, 60% of my constituents, and I have the highest rates of transients, that is people who live in their abode for less than a year at a time. All of those things contribute to a lack of engagement and sense of neighbourhood, community, and low voter turnout in local body elections, amongst other things. Uh, but I think that the opportunity that we have is to um, organise ultimately, to turn that negative into a positive. And this goes back to the point around how do we engage with our new council. It's the same way that you engage with any politician. Don't leave politics to the politicians. Because <laughs> as soon as you do that, things get incredibly polarised. But also they get further and further removed from the people whose decisions, uh, or rather the decisions that are made at a political level, which saturate all of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And those decisions aren't just made every three years with the general local body election. So it's consistently, if you have that ability and that privilege, to be so consistently engaged, but also through organising, we are able to spread the load and make that stuff more sustainable. So getting involved in organisations like Generation Zero or Forest and Bird or whatever else, plant a tree, get to know your neighbours. That's what politics can and should look like. Brilliant. Johnny? Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think from my whakaro, the... The, the biggest threat is remaining in the square. And and the thing about squares, it forces people into corners and you have to take sides, which which is not healthy for for our past and future generations. Um, you know, so I see that as the biggest threat. And, and certainly um, having, you know, observed, lived through COVID, seen post-COVID, look, looking at what's happening globally, um, and the pressure the square system is under and, and how it fails to deliver for our people. And within that is that disconnection from real local level community whānau. Um, in our assessment of the C40 and, and those global groups is, um, uh, to a degree, Auckland's sort of been the only one that's co-partnering with its indigenous communities. So, so if other voices aren't coming through, then, you know, the opportunity to align and have those conversations, but you shouldn't use, lose your local flavour if it's about anchoring back to place. Um, and I think that the, the opportunity is those localised collaborations. Um, there's 19 mana whenua of Auckland, there's 21 local boards. Um, that's where it happens, at the local level, and, and which is really important. Um, one thing we learnt from COVID, you know, and the safety of all our little bubbles is the importance of this concept of, and, you know, importance about let's have a conversation on what we mean by language. Mm. So this concept of scaling. In, in human-centred design, we'll pro prototype, roll it out, and then we want to go to scale. And when we go to scale, it goes over everyone's heads and then it happens to you, not with you. 
But what we learnt was the importance of scaling like scales on the fish. And the little interconnected scales that not only help streamline the fish but also protect the fish. That, that's the important when we sort of go away from that globalisation language because globalisation for Māori is another term for colonisation, westernisation, but in that context it happens to all of us. So there's some tremendous learning if we're able to circle up as opposed to sit in a square. You know, it's really uncomfortable sitting on a panel when it's like we're speaking to you as opposed to sitting in a circle where we share and speak with each other and we learn. And the beautiful thing about a circle is it's also who's not sitting in the circle, not just those who have made the effort to get here. That, that's the opportunity is how do we sort of... Our, our elders use the term recircalization. You know, for us as human beings, we're trying to find our way home. You know, our home to Mother Earth. Whatever belief system, we have a word for it. I just happen to use Māori terms. So we've got to go beyond the jargon of things. Te reo Māori is becoming like a jargon. How do we actually sit down and have a conversation about understanding? So for us, it's about seeking understanding and wisdom, not just necessarily seeking knowledge. And, and knowledge or wisdom sits in the practice, in the action. So it has to be real action-based. And the more sort of conversations we have like this, different worldviews coming together, whether, you know, Tamaki Makoto is our home or Auckland's our home. You know, Auckland's named after a guy that never ever came here. And there's a statue that's out in front of the old Auckland City Council building of Lord Auckland. The Indian city that gifted it to Auckland City in 1960-something were onto it. They got rid of that statue and gifted it to Auckland. <laughs> you know, so, so these are the real opportunities, no matter what worldview we come with, but it's how do we seek that understanding and, and really let's share because I want to see what your eyes see in order for us to understand and how we're going to make, um, you know, Auckland, Auckland's driving this, um, you know, Tamaki Makoto Auckland thing and this, you know, re this journey to Tamaki Makoto. Well, for us, Tamaki Makoto has been here for uh, over a thousand years. So it's not new to us, but it's that old wisdom with new knowledge and those conversations sitting together, that we, that's the real opportunity. Because I'm really interested in your whakaaro and, and, and how we circle up to, to get shit done, basically. Because Papa Tunuku will turn around at some point and wipe us out, just like the dinosaurs. So it's not the planet that's at stake, it's us. You know, that's the, that's the real shift to how we come to terms with this. And I just need to say in closing because my aunties will pull my ears. <laughs> so, you know, there's no... It's not my mistake that most of the people sitting in this room are wahine, that most of our panel are wahine. You know, square systems or patriarchal-centred, and it's about individualism. Our, our, our aunties would say the solution sits in a papatunuku-centred response led by wahine. You know, and so, and that's got nothing to do with gender. That's got to do with wisdom and heart. You know, and that's the opportunity that we can bring into the conversation. And, you know, we've got many generations represented. So how do we get that flow going? So kia ora tate. Kia ora, Johnny. I knew there was a reason I left you to the end. What a beautiful summation of the conversation that we've been having. And I, and I acknowledge it's, you know, we're, we're talking about radical collaboration and, and yet, as you're right, we are sitting in the structural format of a group of people talking at you. That is the, that is the nature of this particular event. I would love to have been able to sit down and have a longer conversation with my friends at the back. Um, not a clout, certainly. At least I'm not a juggler, I suppose. <laughs> High praise indeed. Hey, look, because that is, that is the nature of it. Nobody is setting out to make Auckland's Tamaki Makaura a worse place 
than it is. Uh, you know, everybody in their own way loves this city and they want to make it a better place and there are decisions being made that are difficult and there are conversations being had that are difficult and there are conversations that are not being had because they're difficult to have or because they're difficult uh, to engage with, but they need to be had because, you know, we need to make sure that something is happening. Um, what a wonderful panel. Look, at the end of the day, it does boil down to each and every one of us taking a little bit of responsibility. We can't devolve that responsibility upwards. I always think none of us individually can change the world, but we can change our worlds. We can change the world within, within our families and within our communities, and I think that's the most important part of it because bloody hell, we live in this city, and we love this city, and our kids grow up here, and our parents grow old here. Many of us will be buried in this city, I'm sure. Hopefully not under a cataclysmic lava flow on one of the many volcanic fields of Auckland, but who knows. Um <laughs>